John of the Eye Patch, end of chapter 20, part of chapter 21. Mounds of treasure be a myth, Mr. Owen said. Enough of that talk, Blasbury let go of John and pointed a finger at Mr. Owens. You know I talked to a guru once. He was from the real India, not the one Columbus found. This mystic guru said that our thoughts can make our future happen. Our thoughts? Our thoughts? Our thoughts? The bird parroted. Exactly, Blackbeard nodded. How be that? Mr. Owens asked. Parlay with thoughts? You gotta be savvy. Blackbird clapped his hands together. And my thoughts? Parlay treasure. But what if Blackbeard gets to the island first? John asked. But we have the legendary navigator, Rusty Jones, Blackbird said. All three of them looked to the crow's nest, where Rusty continued his awkward yodel to the sea. I don't even think he knows how to sail, John said. Blackbird leaned in to whisper to John. You were the one that vouched for him. We don't get treasure, it's on you. He poked John's chest with two fingers pressed together. On you, on you. See, the parrot gets it. Blackbird nodded towards the parrot. I know, it's just, I talked to Anne. John was going to tell them that Blackbeard had been to the island before and had actual charts, but before he could say that, Blackbird cut him off saying, Anne, you mean you talked to Blackbeard's daughter? Anne, are you two friends? Blackbird grabbed John by both of the shoulders and shook him. Yeah, I guess you could say that, John said. Lad, why didn't you say something sooner? Blackbird started to squeeze John's shoulders. This could really help me out of the jam we're in. If you talk to her for me, will you, will you please? Let her know that um, I want to be friends with Blackbeard. Uh, well, I think she's kind of young to be your friend. Don't be crazy, I said with Blackbeard. I want to be friends with her dad. If me and Blackbeard were pals, this whole me running into his ship would go away. Yeah, John, the T-boning, John clarified. Yeah, whatever you call it, kid. It'll all be washed under the tides, Blackbird said, making a motion with his hands. Uh, storm on the horizon, guys, Mr. Owens interrupted. <clears throat> no, 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 the opposite of storm. We'll make it clear, he said. Mm, he's, a, he's a storm like Mary, but with, but with Anne's help, we could, it'll be like a gentle tide. John stopped listening to Blackbird bird ramble and instead looked where Mr. Owens was pointing. Ominous black clouds draped like a blanket across the horizon. Uh, Captain, that there be a hurricane and it's headed straight for us. Cap chapter 21. Caught in a hurricane. Bring the jib around. Put the aft forward, Blackbird yet. Full sails! And for the moment, he was loud and energetic, and he was issuing orders like John had always imagined a captain would in some type of emergency. What is he saying? He said to Mr. Owens. He be putting the wind behind us, trying to outrun the storm, Mr. Owens said. Do you think we'll make it? Yeah, with a south track, maybe yar, maybe nay. Best ask ye gods for some help. Mr. Owens scratched his gray beard, and he looked to the back of the ship. <clears throat> the storm closed quickly on the dragon up under. Gusts of winds whisked around the sea in a frothy chomp. Instead of the familiar smooth roll, the deck now lurched violently, side to side and forward and back as the ship was buffeted by the water like a toy in the bathtub. The howling wind flung stringing spray at John and snapped the sails tight enough to make the mast groan sickeningly. John felt a strong grip on his arm. He turned. His mom squinted against the wind. Get below decks. Get below decks, John. You need to go home. John took a step towards the ladder down, and then he stopped when Mr. Owens yelled, Captain Wind be shattering mass before we be free of it. Blackbird looked at the sails. His bravado drained faster than the color of his face. The vast. Furl the sails. Furl the sails. Furl the mine sails, Mr. Owens repeated in a call to the crew. Blackbeard's order, of course. No, no, no. Not just the mainsail. Furl all of them, Blackbird corrected. Mm, without a sail against the wind, we'll be spinning like a top in the water so turbulent, Mr. Elwood said. We'd be feeding the fish for sure. Fine, fine, fine. Reef the foresail, Blackbird yelled. John watched while three square rig masks rose under the main steady pull of the pirates holding onto the ropes. 
With the mainsail furled, the pirates clambered down to the bow of the ship, where they began to partially unfold the full sails so they could crack less storm, catch less storm wind. Crack! John looked around, trying to see what broke. The reef sheet had come in too. Mr. Owens pointed. Mizzen's at full. Uh, what's a reef sheet? John yelled. It's the rope keeping the sail closed. Mr. Owens pointed to a rope that had snapped and whipped around in the wind. The sail can't be reefed. A splintering creak put an icy fear in John. What's that? Storm be tearing the foremast apart, Mr. Owen yelled. Secure the reef sheet, Blackbird yelled. Pirates scrambled to the order, scrambled to follow the order. Several of them were slipping on the now frothy wet deck. John felt pressure against his arm. His mom said, why aren't you below deck? Why haven't you gone home, John? John took a shaky, st shaky step towards the ladder, only for the ch ship to pitch hard from the storm, and he had to grab onto the railing to keep from going overboard. Mom's right. I better get out of here. Keeping both hands on the railing, John stuff shoveled to the ladder, transitioning from the quarter deck to the first step of the ladder, while the ship lurched about was tricky. But it was made easier by his Converse sho shoes and their gripping. They kept him from slipping, sliding, and falling down like several pirates that were all around him. His mom stayed above at the quarter deck with Blackbird and Master Owens. John looked to the bow where the pirates tried to climb the netting on the foresail. Time and time again, they slipped and fell back to the deck, slamming into the gun walls and nearly being overthrown, being thrown overboard. In the seas from this rough, in seas this rough, any man overboard would simply be a lost man. A lost man, except for me, John thought. If he fell overboard, he'd just have to whip off the eye patch. Uh, it'd be the last thing he could do for his mom. But it was better than letting the ship sink from a storm. So John ran across the main deck. He jumped into the netting, his shoes keeping good grip on the netting wall. The wind whipped stinging sprays against his cheeks and his arms. He closed his eyes and he climbed. The ship spun and lurched. John grew dizzy and struggled to keep his grips on the rope. One rung at a time. He climbed. Whap, whap, whap. The wind, everything, the ropes hitting against him. Something smashed into his back. He forced his eyes open to the slits. The broken rope danced in the wind. The reef sheet. That was it. John got a solid grip on the rigging with his left hand, and he reached with his right. The rope wickedly stung his hand. John cried out in pain, and he nearly lost his grip on the rigging. He closed his eyes, and he held his burning hand to his chest. You can do this, he thought. He reached again for the sheet, but instead of trying to catch the whipping cord with his hand, he hooked the rope with the crook of his arm, and he pulled it to his body. His pulse raced. He had the sheet. Good lad, Mr. Owen yelled from below. Bring it down now. John kept the reef sheet tight to his body as he climbed down until he could hand the rope off to the gathered pirates below. There was a collective yell of, Yo ho ho! shouted by the crew. But there was one member of the crew who was less than thrilled by John's heroics. His mom took him roughly by the arm and pulled so hard that she nearly dragged him across the main deck. Every time John caught to his feet, that Every time John got his feet back under him, she pulled again, keeping him off balance. She pushed him into the closet side berth. Don't ever do something that foolish again. But mom, with the, this is not a discussion, John. Don't come back. I'll take a miracle that you survive the storm, but I don't want you drowning with the rest of us. John started to tear up. He pulled off the eye patch. John, dripping water all over his bedroom floor now, gathered another towel from the half-closet to dry off and clean up the puddles he left behind. Finding Mom just to lose her to a hurricane, he hung the eye patch next to his bed and he mopped up the down, and he moped his way downstairs. Hurricane Kiara just made landfall, his dad said without looking away from the television. What? A hurricane? John was surprised by the coincidence. Where? The Bahamas, his dad said, expanding his idea with. It's cutting across the Great Abaco and the Grand Bahama. Fortunately, it looks like it's going to miss the capital, Nassau, on New Providence. If it keeps this up, it'll strengthen and it might even hit Florida. John was already on the run to his dad's office, to a large wall map of the Caribbean. He quickly found New Providence, and from there, he was able to find great Abaco and the Grand Bahama to the north. He recognized the shapes of the islands from the Dragons of Plunder's charts. The hurricane was in exactly the same place as in the past that it was now. 
Taking an interest in geography, his dad entered the office behind him. That's where it is, right. John traced a line where he thought the hurricane was traveling. That's pretty close, his dad said. I just been working on this pirate essay for Academy and knew it was kind of a pirate capital. I can't believe there's a hurricane right there in a place I've just been, he realized his slip. He couldn't tell his dad that that was in the past, so he started thinking. It's strange how coincidences like that happen sometimes, his dad said. You know, they've been tracking hurricane this hurricane for days. They have? John realized that if this hurricane was more than a coincidence, he could keep watch of the weather and he could give Blackbird and his mom advanced warning of future storms if they survive this one. How fast is the storm moving? John asked. I don't know, but we can find out. His dad sat at the desk and he turned on his computer. He brought up a weather tracking for the hurricane. It looks like it's moving 200 miles a day. He did the math in his head. 16 miles an hour. John grinned. How wide is it? Well, it's almost 150 miles. His dad, his dad ran a little simulation. John stared at the screen where he thought the Dragon of Plunder was. As the simulation ran, it looked like the ship would be out of danger in six hours. He wanted to pull on the eye patch and let his mom know how long they were in danger, but she probably wouldn't appreciate him jumping right back into harm's way so quickly just to give a weather update. If they did sink, it's better to go back when the waves are calm, he thought. You seem lost in thought, his dad said. I'm just wondering what it's like to be caught in a hurricane, but on a pirate ship. You're really putting a lot of thought and work into this essay, his dad said. <clears throat> Everything I can, Dad, John smiled. Early reports on the storm make it sound like it's one of the worst to hit the Bahamas in years, his dad shook his head. The hurricane might have put the dengue e epidemic on pause by devastating mosquito populations, but the people there... They're going to need a lot of help. I'm going to have to leave earlier than I expected. What's that mean for me then, Dad? John asked. It means you're going to have to go to boarding school this week. His dad's smile looked forced. John was stunned. If his mother was shipwrecked and his dad sent him to boarding school, it would be like becoming an orphan, just when he was so close to getting his whole family back. Even swallowing was difficult. John needed to think of something, so to stall, he said... Dad, what if I go with you? I don't think that's a good idea, John. What had his dad said about the Caribbean being unsafe? John suddenly remembered and said, You just said the dengue isn't a threat right now, so it's safe for me to go with you. Don't you know what a disaster relief zone is like? His dad asked. No, but I never will unless you show me, and you're always telling me that I should volunteer, that I should give back. While he did want to help people, his main goal was going to get back, was to stay close to his dad. He, he knew he needed his dad in his life. Helping people in a situation like this is hard work, John. Yeah, but so were the blackberry bushes, John said. His dad laughed. It was an unexpected and wonderful sound that made John smile. His dad laughed so infrequently since mom's disappearance. Yes, blackberry brambles are a lot of work. John shared a smile with his dad. We might be in villages where children are dying or have died. His dad's smile turned to a somber look. I understand, but there will be children who need my help. I can do that. I can give out water or bandages or just be their friend, John said. His dad stood and ruffled John's hair. You seem to be full of surprises this summer, John. Thanks. All right, John. Get a bag packed. I'm not sure when we'll be leaving, his dad said. So I get to come with you? John asked, afraid he'd heard his dad wrong. Yes, you can come with me. The two of them shared a hug. John cried from relief and joy, but he wiped his eyes before his dad could see.